This is a production of Cornell University. Well, thank you so much, Don. Thanks for inviting me to come and do this talk today. I'm really excited to be back here and to show everyone what I've been doing for the past 10 years. Um, so first of all, I just like to start out with what a city forester does because it's confusing to a lot of people. So they think like forestry, they think like timber production, like what are you doing exactly? So obviously street trees is pretty much the main thing that I work on. So we manage all the street trees and park trees in the city of Ithaca. I'm also in charge of the parks. So I'm sort of in charge of the parks department in general. Um, and so this, does anyone know which park this is? I'm not calling on Jules. No, not Baker Park. Washington. Washington Park, exactly. So that's Washington Park right there. So I'm in charge of all the little pocket parks in Stewart Park. Cass Park and the rec program is run by the Youth Bureau, but all the other parks I'm in charge of. So Stewart Park is one that I'm in charge of there. And then also random things like the carousel down at Stewart Park. I have to hire carousel <coughs> operators and manage them throughout the summer. Um, also the natural areas, I try to do as much as I can in the natural areas. So we have Ithaca Falls, we have Six Mile Creek natural area. Those are all areas that I try to keep an eye on. The city cemetery is another uh, section that I'm in charge in. So I've, in my 10 years, I've had to sign off on three burials in the city cemetery. So that's pretty exciting as well. And then also I just work um, with other departments within the city. So whenever we have um, this is a picture of me on the Commons. So I was part of the Commons Design Committee and things like that, planning department, water and sewer, whenever they're doing projects that might impact trees, I work with them. Um, so the city forester is more than just trees. Um, and I've recently started watching the show Parks and Rec. And I really feel like that is taken from my life. So, um, so the first, uh, just a little bit of background um, from the city of Ithaca so you kind of know where we're at here. So the first inventory was done in the 1930s by the first city forester, Charles Baker. And we have this um, down in our office. It's this old street maps book and it has all handwritten um, locations of the trees with little notations on what they've been, you know, what kind of tree they are, if they were removed and things like that. And we're working right now with um, the Cornell's uh, digital library to try to digitize this so we can make it available to people and people can look at it. Um, we have our tree inventory online. Um, so you can look at the tree that's in front of your house or around the block from you and look up what it is. And so this could maybe be linked to that. So you could say, if you have a really old tree, you could be like, oh yeah, there it is in that book as well. Um, we have over 11,000 street trees in our inventory. So that's the street trees and the park trees. It does not include the trees in a natural area or wooded areas. We don't have any of those inventoried. And our trees are on a four year inspection rotation. So um, we have different management areas and every management area is assigned to a particular year. And so each tree is looked at once every four years. So we can use that information to uh, base our work on. So we can use that to pri prioritize what work we're gonna do. We also use um, resident call-ins and complaints and things like that and requests to create work, but we are able to prioritize some of our own work, which I think is pretty unique. Most cities don't do that. And so they really run off a complaint driven system rather than kind of prioritizing what might be the most important work to be done. And Ithaca has a forester and we have a dedicated uh, tree crew. So we have a tree crew with a bucket truck and we do all our own work and we can contract out a little bit of work, but we do mostly all of our own work, which is really rare for a city our size. Most municipalities, even larger than us, if they do do tree work, they contract it all out. So that's really helpful for us. We can be very reactive, we can really change what we're doing on a dime. We don't have these big contracts that we set up and then have to run through a year before we change our priorities and what we're doing. Um, and Ithaca has been focusing on planting trees for many, many years. And um, every time we remove a tree, we try to replace it within a year, if it makes sense to put a tree back in that spot. And we're at almost 100% stocking level. So that means we don't have a lot of open spots that just need trees. So really when I make my tree orders, I have to really anticipate how much work we're gonna get, how many trees we're gonna take out before the next planting cycle starts. Make sure I don't end up with a whole bunch of trees I don't have places for. Um, and Ithaca has been a tree city for more than 30 years. So Tree City is a, is a designation that the New York State DEC uh, manages. And um, it's, a, it's a national thing, but the DEC manages it for each uh, state. And so there's certain criteria you have to meet to become a tree city. And we've been a tree city for over 30 years. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is diversity. And um, the city of Ithaca has a very diverse urban forest. 
And there's reasons for that. So just for an example, um, the Dutch elm disease um, was introduced in the United States in 1928. And it's a fungal inspection that's spread by bark beetles. And so the damage to, that you see on the tree is what the beetle does, but it infests the tree with a fungus that kills the tree. And this is a picture of um, East Ave here on Cornell campus. And so it was, used to be all lined with elm trees. And there's a little stone here, um, kind of near Day Hall. And it kind of looks like a gravestone. And it says Ostrander on it. And Ostrander was a local farmer who wanted to contribute something to the university when it first started. And so he contributed a whole bunch of elm trees from his property and they planted them all along the road. And then Dutch elm disease came through and killed them all. So this used to be a monument as like honoring this person who donated something. And now it looks like a tombstone for all these trees that are no longer there. And so keeping that in mind, that is really why we have focused so much on making sure we have a diverse urban forest because things like that do come and things like that will continue coming into our community. And so we need to make sure that we have a diverse um, palette of trees out there so that we don't lose an entire street of trees like that. So um, we have 217 different tree species planted in the parks and streets and comprising of 66 different genera. So here is what uh, we've got here. So Norway maple is our most plentiful tree. It was a very popular tree at one time and we've been slowly working down. The last time we did this analysis was in 2013 and we were up around 12% was Norway maple and now we've got it down to about 10%. So we don't plant Norway maple anymore and we take a lot of them out. And so their proportions are changing. Um, and then for um, genus, obviously maple again is gonna be our most popular with the Norway maple, then mix in silver maple and sugar maple and things like that. Um, a second is oak though. And it was interesting, I was looking at that this morning and thinking like, so crab apple is our second most popular species and oak, you don't see oak show up till down here, but it's our second most popular genus. So I was like trying to reason that through and it's because <coughs> Quercus, we just have so many different kinds, so many different species of oak. When you lump them all together, we have a lot of oak trees, but when you put them out by species, we don't have a ton of any one of them. Um, so, so, so diversity is something that we really, it's not like a new development, but it's something that the city has been thinking about for a long time. And so it's um, kind of a new idea for some communities um, that haven't really put a lot of thought into it. But, um, for Ithaca, it's something that we've been doing for a long time to keep our forests healthy. So another thing we've been working on is creating good conditions for the next generation of urban trees. Um, and so one thing that we worked on and got completed in like 2016, 2017 was to really update our ordinance for site plan review. So projects have to come before site plan review if it's a big development project and you know they're tearing down a building and putting up an apartment building or things like that. And so our our stuff that we had in there, our requirements for the landscaping and treescaping was not great. It wasn't really clear. It was somewhat out of date um, and didn't really have a lot of teeth to it. it. Didn't have a lot of helpful information for developers either to point them in the right direction. And so we worked on trying to create something that had clear guidance um, and, and standards and would really create optimal conditions for trees so that they could meet their design uh, their design goal, you know, so, you know, when they show you this picture of this tree that's 30 feet tall in front of their building, what do we really need to do to make sure that that tree achieves that status at some point? Private property? Um, it concludes private property, um, yes, because it's like when the, when the building is being developed, so when the lot is being developed, and sometimes that bleeds over into the streetscape as well, so as part of their project, they might have to plant some street trees, so it's a, it's, it can be both things. Um, so one thing we looked at, that kind of motivated us to do this was looking at the tree canopy. So this was done by our GIS folks um, at the city in 2013, and it, and it broke up into our different management areas and what the uh, forest canopy was, the tree canopy of the different sections. Um, and so there's a recent study out of the University of Wisconsin that said that you know they were looking at about 40% canopy coverage is what you kind of need to achieve a good um, temperature mediation in the summer. Um, for, to, for heat and things like that. So, um, so we're doing pretty good. We've got some 44, 52, 39, 35. And I think um, south side and north side are kind of low, but that's because the, the lines are drawn kind of funny. I think if you look at the actual residential areas, they're very similar to like Fall Creek. So they probably fall around the 40% um, as well. So 
we really wanted to think about making sure we're preserving that because the mature trees are the ones that are giving you the most benefit. So we can have developers plant out a bunch of little new trees, but they're not gonna provide a bunch of shade for quite a while. Um, and also just looking at the urban environment. So this is a picture from about 1900. This is Green Street. So right here, you'd be, be like a Diamonds restaurant, like kind of right there. And um, this is like a Press Bay Alley. So this is the same view. So looking down here, this house is that house there and that house, that one right there. So you look at how different that is. These are all elm trees. This first one in line is a maple and then there's a horse chestnut and then a bunch of elm trees. So these are all honey locusts. So they're different trees now. But you can look at, you know, in the, in the lifetime of a tree, you could have, definitely have a sugar maple that lives through that lifespan. And so to think about how that environment has changed for that tree over that, that course. So you look at the street has been widened, it's been paved, there's probably all kinds of utilities. They shortened up the tree lawn, like narrowed it up to widen the road. So when you think about all these challenges that trees are facing, um, we really wanna try to preserve what we, what we have. Um, and so we wanted to protect, protect existing trees that are planted on the street and that are on private property, identify utility conflicts in advance so that we can uh, maybe shift where the utilities are and preserve trees and require adequate protection. This is very common, what is in there. And when people present, uh, when developers present their plans, they often stipulate something like this to preserve trees. And it's just like kind of, you know, put up a fence just around the base of the tree. And that prevents people from backing into it, but it doesn't protect the majority of the tree. We have to think about the root system of the tree and protecting that. So our tree protection plan, um, we, we require a site inventory, so you have to tell us what kind of trees are on the site and what kind of condition they're in, because we don't want to list a tree to be preserved that's already in bad health. We're going to try to preserve ones that are already in good health. Um, to identify the critical root zone, so that's the, really the most important part of the roots that absolutely needs to be maintained and protected if we want the tree to survive long term. Um, identifying if trees need to be pruned before construction, so oftentimes there will be a building face that is going to be up against a street tree, that, did, that wasn't there before. And so to prune that before construction starts and not wait till you know, the masons are coming to put the bricks on and they need to put up their scaffolding and they need that tree trimmed tomorrow and then they, you know, the construction guys just show up with their sawzalls and just go at it to make space. Like we, that's the type of thing we wanna to try to avoid. Um, identify proper protection measures. So to make sure we're protecting as much space around the tree as we possibly can. Um, identify if there's any post-construction care. So if we need to, say that they have to mulch the trees and they have to water them for the first year or two, things like that to kind of help the trees if they're being stressed. And then also I, uh, how protection is gonna be communicated. So in a lot of these big jobs, there's multiple subcontractors that come in. And so every, you know, the electricians come in and then the masons come in and then the plumbers come in. And to make sure that everyone coming onto that site understands why that fencing is there and that it can't just be moved because you wanna park your truck in the shade or because you have some uh, material being delivered and you need to set it somewhere. So to have documentation on that fence to say this is tree protection, it cannot be moved. Um, other things that we can ask for is things like air spading. So if we really want to preserve a tree but a utility line has to be run to a new building, you can use high powered air to blow the soil out and protect a lot of the roots and without severing them and then just feed your line underneath. Um, so yeah, so we also, so preserving trees, mature trees is one thing we wanna do. And then also making sure that the, that the new trees that are being planted are being set up for success to make sure that they have that inter, underground infrastructure so they can realize their design intent. So really thinking about what are they building underground to support trees. So soil is really important. And I talk about soil so much when I do my review of site plan criteria, I'm always talking about dirt. Like they're probably like, oh, the dirt lady's talking about soil again. So um, often in urban environments, the soil is poor quality. Um, it's poor structurally, so often it's very compacted. So it doesn't have those macro pores in it that will hold moisture, that will allow for air exchange um, and things like that that the tree roots need. Um, also contaminants, so there's a lot of concrete, which is, um, affects the pH of soil, which can be a problem for some species of tree. Um, and then also low soil volume. So that's the example here. So if you just don't have a lot of space for the tree to grow, it doesn't have the structural support it needs. And this picture is from uh, Queens, New York, where I used to live and look at trees for the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, and you know, you'd get a big windstorm and big trees would just tip over because they just were growing in little, basically little you know, uh, planting pots and they just fall over. 
So um, better care at planting. So making sure that the soil that the trees are being planted in um, is high quality soil that they can utilize. So the scoop and dump method is something we worked on with uh, Nina Basic. She's been doing that here um, to uh, great success in a lot of the gardens around here. So the idea is that you put a layer of compost on top of your planting area and then you take a backhoe and you just kind of gently paw through the area to kind of get these veins of compost to the soil. So you're not rototilling, you're not totally destroying the soil structure. You're just incorporating a little bit of organic matter for the trees to access. And so like I said, she's done it a bunch, of t a bunch up here on campus and we worked with her to set up an experiment downtown. So along Route 13, where we have a difficult time getting trees to establish, um, we picked about a dozen sites and half of them got the scoop and dump method and the other half didn't and we're monitoring them. They've all survived the first year. So we're gonna, she's gonna have students out there monitoring, taking samples of the soil and things like that and measuring the trees and, and seeing how much of a difference it's making for the trees there. The other thing we're working on is mulch. So like, I'm crazy about mulch as well. So we have March Mulch, mulch Madness, um, where we mulch things like crazy. So it's really great. You know, I don't know if we've got any turf aficionados in here, but um, trees do not like turf. So, you know, they don't like to have that competition for uh, moisture, for nutrients and things like that. So really what trees want is just a huge mulching around them. So these trees down at Route 13, we did the same thing. We gave them all a lot of mulch to help them uh, make it there. Um, so thinking about all that, we did have some new standards in our, um, in our ordinance that we passed for site plan review. So we wanna to try to preserve soil. So making sure that their staging is thought of. So where are we gonna stage all the equipment for this construction? Making sure that we have a minimum of entrances into the site so that people aren't just driving all over the tree lawn and compacting all the soil before new trees are planted. And making sure that the um, sites are prepared adequately, that we have enough soil volume for trees. And we have some other um, things that we suggest that people use, they're not requirements, but they're suggestions that they can use. Um, one thing with the urban environment is just trying to pack a lot of stuff in there. So you have your street, you wanna have off street parking, you wanna have a bike trail, you wanna have a um, sidewalk and a tree lawn. And that's a lot of space to fit in the right of way there. And people wanna build right up to their property lines as well so they can maximize the square footage of the lot as well. So trying to make areas that can overlap is helpful. So people have seen tree grates before. They're these big metal grates that go over trees, but they're kind of difficult to deal with. I don't really like them that much. As a tree grows, you kind of have to cut away the metal in some way to make sure there's enough room for the tree. If there's some surface roots or things like that, the grates can get uneven and then become tripping hazards. It's not really a good way to fix that. So this is a product that we've been kind of experimenting with called FlexiPave, and there's other products out there that are the same thing. But they're, um, it's ground up tires and a little bit of gravel and then they mix it with an epoxy and spread it on there and it just water runs right through it. But it is a surface that um, passes the ADA uh, standard, so American with Disabilities Act, to make sure it's a level enough surface that people with different walking abilities can, can use that surface safely. Um, and so that's helpful. One thing I've been thinking of is um, the dark color of it though, and I'm wondering if we should be recommending a lighter color of it because it does seem to get pretty hot, especially with these young trees that aren't casting a lot of shade on it yet. And I'm wondering how that affects the soil temperature. So that would be an interesting thing to look at, the difference of survivorship with trees that have light colored um, flexi pave versus darker colored flexi pave. Another thing we, we uh, try to encourage is structural soil, which is another thing that Nina and her graduate students um, worked on here at Cornell. And so uh, structural soil is basically like number, dirty number two stone. So it's number two stone, all the fines are taken out of it. So all the pieces are irregularly shaped, but they're the same dimensions basically. And you can pack them together and get the compaction you need to put pavement and things like that on top of it. But there's enough gaps in between it because the pieces are so irregular and they don't fit together real tight like a puzzle um, that the tree roots can actually move through it. And it doesn't work for every tree species, but there's a lot of tree species that, that can access that. Um, so here is an example of something we put in our ordinance for developers to look at and reference. And it, this is one of Nina's students created this for us. Um, and so you don't have to use structural soil, just you know an example like this where you wanna pave over it. You can also use it in an example like this where you're just putting it under the flags of, um, the flags of sidewalk right adjacent to the tree so the tree can move through that structural soil and then access whoopsies and then access the lawn 
on the other side of the sidewalk. And so if you don't really have a huge soil volume in the actual tree lawn, trees can still get past that barrier of the compacted soil of the sidewalk and access the soil on the other side. Um, so here's another thing that is in our ordinance that I was pretty excited about. Um, so here is Wegmans, and here's Wegmans parking lot and Tops and that parking lot and these other parking lots. So this is 2002 and this is 2013, and those parking lots look exactly the same. So those trees that are growing there had a decade to get bigger, and there's like no measurable difference. You can't see that they've gotten any bigger. So parking lot design is something that um, really needed a lot of help. And so it's, there's, again, the same situation as on the street, low soil volume, poor soil quality, oftentimes it's just kind of whatever soil they have left over from construction and they pile it up and put a curb around it, stick a tree in it, put some mulch on top and call it good. Um, and it doesn't usually turn out well. Species selection was also not very great in a lot of situations. So for a parking lot, you wanna pick a species that is very drought tolerant and heat tolerant. And that's not what we were seeing in a lot of the parking lots around. And there was also no establishment care. So there was nobody out there watering the tree for the first year or two to help it get established. So it was pretty much good luck to your tree. And most times they don't make it and they die and you stick another tree in and it dies and you put another tree in and that's just perpetual. But those trees are never growing to the point where they're actually producing shade for that parking lot. So we put in our ordinance recommendations to make a better parking lot. So we require adequate soil volume. So you needed actual legitimate soil. You couldn't just scrape up whatever you had left over construction. You need to actually have legitimate soil and in the right quantities to support the type of tree that you're suggesting. So if you're just putting crab apples, that's less soil than if you're gonna try to grow a honey locust or something like that. We also require a really high planting area of 25%. So that's a quarter of your parking lot needs to, be, needs to be planting area. And nobody wants that because the parking lot is there for people to park in. So in order to give up some of that percentage, um, you can upgrade some other things to minimize that planting area. So if you have stormwater swale, so you have these little curb cuts and you, and you slope the, um, and grade the parking lot in a way that the soil can run into those swales, it can water the trees. Um, one thing you have to think about is making sure you have an underdrain because these situations can kind of be like boom or bust, like totally bone dry. And then when it rains, all the water from the parking lot floods in there. And if there's no outlet or overflow, they just become bathtubs and then the trees drown. So you have to think about that. Um, and then we also have suggestions for structural soil too. Oops, sorry. So this is an example of here's your planting area in actual organic soil. And then beyond that, you can have structural soil that you can use porous pavement over, and then you can use that for parking spots. So, you, so a planting area that used to be this big, you can fit two more cars there if you, if you put in this other infrastructure. Um, and this is showing different um, scenarios. So if you have two small trees, how far apart do they have to be? If you have a larger tree or a very large tree, how much soil volume do you have to provide for those trees? So um, I think it would be much nicer to show up to a parking lot that looks like this and to come out to your car when you're done shopping and not have a car that's like 120 degrees inside. Um, but it's a matter of motivating developers to put in that infrastructure to do that. And it's interesting because since we had this um, in effect, we've only had one parking lot be designed and that's the Green Star parking lot where they're moving there by Purity Ice Cream. And so they have their water from the parking lot is flowing into the tree area and they have a drain for it. And um, so we'll see how those trees do over time. It'll be a nice experiment to see if those, you know, in the next 10 years, those trees really grow and are providing shade to that parking lot. And then we can go back and look at, you know, the parking lots down on the south side and still the same trees, the same size and not providing any shade. Another thing I've really put a lot of effort into is public engagement. And so, um, we do a lot with public engagement in relation to the street trees. One thing, um, I'll start with this one, I guess. So we have signs that we put up on the trees that say this tree is scheduled to be removed, city of Ithaca, and, and a phone number so that people can call and ask, like, why is this tree going to be removed, whatever. And one day we, I found this on a tree. Someone had taken off that sign and put this sign on. And, you know, it doesn't make me mad at all. Like, I love it because it shows that people in this community are, they care about trees, they're engaged, you know. Um, and so I think it's great. So I put this up in my office and I still have it there. Um, and so 
you know, it's great to have that point of contact with people that if they're concerned about why did you make a decision to take this tree down or not, that I can have a conversation with them and say, okay, well, I know it's a really big old tree. It's a sugar, it's a silver maple, it's hollow, it's been dropping limbs, it's not safe, you know, and people are, you know, they come to terms with it. They understand that like, okay, it's a safety thing. It's sad that that tree has to go, but it has to go. And they always feel better to know that we're going to plant another tree in its place and, and all that. Um, another thing is with tree establishment. So for years, we'd been putting these green watering bags on trees. And I think at first people just didn't even know what they were. Like, what is this there for? And then we started putting flyers in people's doors when they got a new tree in front of their house that said, you know, please water the tree. Please take care of it. Give us a call if you have any problems. Here's what kind of tree it is. Um, and then I would still get calls from people being like, I tried to water it, but I don't understand. I'm putting water in it. It's flowing through. I don't understand. So then we made this little informational card that we just laminate and then stick on the bags. Um, and it shows you exactly how to fill it up with a picture and what it's doing and how it works and what my phone number is if you still have questions. And I found it to be very effective. Most people want to water their tree and they just like don't know how to do it. Um, and so this has really helped. And so I'll drive around and I'll see water bags full out there after we plant trees for the first summer. Each tree gets this that just got planted. Um, and so um, it's really reduced the amount that we have to send out the water truck to go and water trees. So look, we're trying to do something great for the environment. We're trying to plant trees and then we have to send out this big diesel guzzling truck with water to fill the trees. Like it just didn't really make sense in my mind. So to try to limit that as much as we can. And so the last few years, we've really limited the watering that we have to do. Um, we wait until there's like a real stretch with no rain. And then I prioritize the trees that are in commercial districts or just in neighborhoods where I feel like they're not really getting watered. Um, and so it really limits the amount of resources we have to put into it. And it's not, it's not very hard for people to water, um, to water their trees. And then people also get a notice after the tree's removed, they get a notice in their door when we go to grind the stump so that they can call me and have any kind of input on the new tree that they get. So they can either select from the species that I'm gonna order or if there's something they really have their heart set on and it seems like it would be a good match for that spot and it's available, I'll order it for them. So that they have that investment into the tree and so they care about it, they'll remember to water it, they'll remember to call me if they think there's something wrong with it. So that just in that little bit more of effort really gets people more engaged in the tree that's in front of their house. We've also been working on doing tree tours and so we did a few tree tours. We partnered with Bike Walk Tompkins and we did some bicycling tree tours of a couple neighborhoods. Um, we had a tree tour already of Stewart Park. We did one for the city cemetery as well. So we have one for Fall Creek and Southside neighborhood. And so you can go onto the city website and just search for tree tour and you can find this and you can call it up on your phone and it, you know, you click one of the tours and it zooms in and it shows you like the path to walk and you get to each tree and it has a little paragraph about what's special about that tree. So you can use this to get to know the trees in your neighborhood. Um, the thing we're working on currently is a residential tree ordinance. And so we taking a look at um, the canopy coverage, we realize that most of the really great canopy coverage is internal to the blocks. It's really not so much the street trees that are doing it, it's the trees inside the blocks. And so there are communities that do do uh, require permits or have restrictions on trees that you can remove from your own property. And so we've been exploring that and, and I've interviewed a couple other communities that have ordinances like that. Um, and we're trying to figure out how we can best fit that into the city of Ithaca. And so there's definitely reservation with trying to tell people how they can manage their own property. Um, but I think it's important if really what we wanna do is, is per, as a, protect that tree canopy. It's something we really have to think about doing. And it does seem that in some communities, it's not so much that they're really trying to prevent removal of trees, but they just want that one more point of contact with someone that could come out and say, well, what's your goal for removing this tree? Oh, it has some dead limbs. Well, you could really actually prune it. You don't need to remove it. Or, you know, you don't like raking the leaves. Well, maybe we could get a neighbor to help you out. We don't really have to remove the tree right now. So just having that one more point of contact to maybe prevent some of that um, is, Kind of what we're looking at right now. So we're doing a lot in the city of Ithaca um, and I'm pretty proud of the work that we do. We've, you know, we're working on diversity of species all the time. We constantly trying to update our ordinance. We're working on possibly doing a new ordinance, trying to protect the trees we have, focusing on underground infrastructure for trees, and um, you know, really getting the public engaged and um, caring about the trees in the city. So this is a kind of a 
promotional pamphlet that the Tree City for New York State came out with. And so it has all kinds of statistics on it there. And Ithaca right here, it has the longest growth award. So the Tree City USA has four, four criteria you have to meet to become a Tree City USA. So once you've met that, you can pretty much do it every year. So Poughkeepsie got in there at the ground level and they got 40 years. So we're only at 30 something. We're never gonna catch up with them. But if you go above and beyond those four criteria, you earn points towards earning a growth award. And Ithaca has earned a growth award 21 years, and that's the most of any city in the state of New York. So I'm pretty proud about that too. Um, and so if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer questions for the next few minutes. Ken? I understand in dry areas, um, where there are orchards, almonds, and things like that in California and Israel, they use triple irrigation mm -hmm. trees, mm -hmm. and that tends to concentrate the roots in the zone where the wire is percolated down, and you don't get as much exposure. Right. Is that happening with your tree uh, bag? Yeah, that's exactly how the tree bags work. So, so you might want to repeat the question. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, Ken was asking about um, trickle irrigation and doing a slow watering of trees so that you get a deeper water rather than a surface watering that just kind of runs off and doesn't doesn't put a, doesn't target a lot of the water at the tree roots. So that's exactly what the tree bags do, the watering bags. So there, it's a double wall um, structure and you fill, fill it up so that you have this kind of like donut of water. And then in the bottom of the bag, there's very little holes. And so the water literally just drips out. So you fill it up and it takes maybe all day for the water to drip out. And so that allows the water to seep in really deeply into the soil. So if you just go out there with a garden hose and you stand there for 20 minutes, you might dump gallons of water on it, but you're watering a very shallow amount over a wide area. And what's best for the trees is a very deep watering over a very small area where all the new roots are. Um, and so that's exactly what the water bags do. And so they're much more effective than just pouring water on the tree. But might that make the trees unstable in a high wind? The roots are all constantly? Well, we only water them like that for the first year. So it's really just tending to those new roots that are just right, kind of trying to branch out, and then we take it out. You can zip them together. So if you have a bigger tree, you can kind of keep increasing that diameter. You can, because there's just zippers, so you can just zip two together, or three together, and then fill them up all around the tree. So if you're transplanting larger trees or you have a particularly drought sensitive tree that you just want to water through the summer, it's a great way to do that. Don? Gene, in response to both changing climate and new diseases and insects, in what ways are you changing the species mix of trees that you select each year? Yeah, so Don's question was about species selection in the face of changing climate and new insect infestations. And so that's all what we're going for with our diversity. So we're always looking to make sure we have a diverse number of species so that when we get new diseases, that we, um, that we have a diverse palette of, of trees out there. We're always looking for new varieties that are coming out. So we usually, like something will come out and I'll notice it or Nina will notice it in the trade and say, we should grab a couple of these and we plant some and see if they work. And if they do well, we order more. Um, and then for climate change, we do find that we can get away with some pretty um, uh, winter tender trees down downtown in Ithaca. So we can plant, we have some trees that are like zone seven trees, some of those uh, leather leaf uh, magnolias, those evergreen magnolias that we have downtown. They've been there for 15 years now maybe. And uh, they're like a zone seven. You see those growing on medians down in Florida. So, so we're always kind of trying to push the envelope and, and see what new species we can get to establish. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about um, mulch and the Asian um, earthworm. earthworm. Because those um, earthworms seem to have completely colonized the south side. And yeah. I'm noticing that if you use hardwood mulch, it seems to just encourage them to go crazy. Yeah. I don't know. How widespread are they? In yeah. Area? So the question is about the use of organic bark mulch or ground up mulch and Asian earthworms, which is a a species that's come in here and it's it's pretty bad especially for forested areas they really can plow through that organic layer on the soil and just um, just decompose it far quicker than is normal for this area and it causes problems with erosion and things like that um, and so I have found that they do they chew right through that stuff pretty quickly so last um, year I had the parks crew mulch big areas underneath some trees where it was so shaded that we didn't have much grass. And I said, you know what, let's just put big mulch 
mulch islands out there and we'll probably only have to do it every other year and just driving by some of those parks this year like that mulch is almost totally gone already and I think it must be the Asian earthworms I find them pretty much everywhere in Ithaca we've done we planted a bunch of bulbs up in Bryant Park up in Bell Sherman they're there they're downtown in front of my office the garden there I work on um, I think they're pretty widespread through probably most of the city do you so. think they can dam damage young trees though because uh, it seemed like once they run out of mulch the trees sometimes they go deeper in go shock um i haven't noticed that um we don't replenish the mulch on street trees typically so the trees get mulched when they get planted and then after that they're kind of on their own so either grass grows up to them or some or the homeowner puts in mulchers so the only time we kind of remulch is the in the parks and I haven't, I haven't really found that to be an issue yet, but definitely something to consider because they are very aggressive and plentiful. So from the diversity question of, of what you're selecting, are there any other sort of ecosystem services that you're considering? I mean, you've talked about the, the heating mm -hmm. cooling feature, but I don't know, pollinators, things like that. Are there any other considerations that are in there? Yeah, so uh, the question is about considerations when we're choosing new species and diversity, and are we just focusing on purely diversity, or are we looking for other attributes in the trees? Um, and certainly we are. So, you know, we try to plant, uh, like I was saying, oaks, you know, that's one species that supports a whole, a whole plethora of different insects. It's one of the best genuses to, to plant if you want to support a diverse to ecosystem. And so we have a lot of different kinds of oak trees. Um, we try to, we try to plant as much native stuff as we can. Um, so the area along the side of a street isn't necessarily a native habitat, so we can't get native trees to grow in all those places, but whenever we can do native trees, we try to do that. Um, and, uh, yeah. Are you targeting things like, like nesting? I mean, squirrels in the open. Right. Like those types of... Yeah, I would... Or yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily that we think about that. Um, I do feel like, unfortunately, a lot of our activities reduces nesting opportunities because the trees that we're usually pruning and removing are trees that have cavities in them. And so we definitely don't have a, you know, a blanket statement where if a tree has a cavity in it, we got to cut it down, we got to remove it. I definitely like, if I notice there's a cavity, I'll have the tree crew check it out. They'll investigate it. They'll see how decayed it is and kind of we make a determination whether we can leave it or not. Um, I have left a couple tall tree stumps as well. Um, there's been some residents that are willing to leave that in front of their house and I'm willing to leave that in front of their house. And we have these signs that say this is, this is like habitat and it'll come down eventually. But you know, let the woodpeckers pick away at it and stuff like that. So if you take all the branches off, you really are reducing the risk that it's going to damage anything or injure anyone. Um, so we do try to do that. But that is something I'm conscious of is that I feel like, you know, we're, we're really making a lot of cavity nesters homeless a lot of times with the with our so street trees. Yep, we have uh, at Stewart Park for sure. We've definitely put up a bunch of nesting boxes. Um, I just put up a chickadee nesting box in front of my office that I can see from my window. Um, and I've thought about that too, the possibility of putting up, you know, bigger nesting boxes. If we do have to take away a big tree, you know, is there another big tree across the street that is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of one situation where we have a silver maple that I know is not in good situation, but the one across the street is a big sycamore that doesn't have any holes in it. So if we put a nest box in that tree, um, the thing, the problem, kind of my stumbling block with that is then how do we maintain it? So how do we go back and make sure we're cleaning out the nest box? How do we make sure that that isn't going to become a hazard and rot and then fall off the tree? And so it's a time commitment if we start putting that stuff out there. Um, we have also worked with NYSEG. So, um, so the NYSEG forester is really into birds. His wife works at Cornell Lab Ornithology. And so I've worked with him. We've put up a bunch of osprey nesting posts down at Stewart Park. Um, we have uh, an owl nesting cone up in Stewart Park as well. So we try where we have opportunities like that to do things like that. Jean, have you begun to preemptively remove ash? We have, yes. So that's something I didn't put in here, but we have, yeah. So we, over the past, I don't know, five or six years, we've been trying to pick away at our ash. And then we found it infestation two years ago. And we treated some of the ash trees and we're continuing to try to take some of them down. So we are trying to do a slow swap over 
and preserving a lot of them. Um, so hopefully when we get that to that part in the cycle where there's like all the trees are just dying all at once, we'll, we'll have more of a handle on it than a lot of communities have found themselves. Anything else? Have you found any challenges with the permaculture part with some of the fruit trees that, um, is there any particular challenge? Sure. Yeah, so the question was about um, down in Conley Park, um, which is behind the Science Center. Um, it's kind of also been named Permaculture Park. There was a cooperative extension group that wanted to make that more of a permaculture garden and have fruits and things like that that people could just walk through and, and gather if they wanted to. Um, I haven't had any issues with that um, in terms of like people really complaining about it or having any problems like that. Um, it is a maintenance is always an issue and so we don't at the city we don't really have staff that can maintain something like that and so we rely on cooperative extension there's been a lot of volunteers from green star that have come over and helped as well so that's that's the main issue with that um, i do get questions from people sometimes when we're planting a new tree as a street tree and they want a persimmon or they want a walnut or they want something like that and i i really try to steer them in a different direction um, I, I i definitely appreciate the the thought process behind permaculture and the intention and everything it's just very difficult especially in Ithaca where we have a transient community where the person who's like promises they're going to take care of that mulberry moves away in three years and then the next person that moves in is like there are these mulberries all over my car you know so I, I try to I try to steer people in other directions I think parks are maybe good opportunities for that but just along the street there's a lot of complications there unfortunately One last question from Tom. Oh, sorry. I have, I have a very site specific question. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's quite all right. The um, Victorian wall, stone wall going up University Avenue, mm -hmm. up into the uh, cemetery, the city yes. cemetery. Yes. It's had a lot of tree removal recently. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Why was that done? Sure. Was it protective or yeah. and part two question? A lot of the tombstones within and grave sites within the cemetery have trees grown over them that are obviously very disruptive of the former cemetery units. Yeah. How, how are we dealing with all that? Sure. So Tom's question was about the city cemetery. So our city cemetery is pretty old. Like I think the first burial in there was like in 1790 or something ridiculous like that. So it's expanded over time, but there's some very, very old stones in that cemetery. And if you come up the lower side of the cemetery along University Ave, there's like an old just laid stone retaining wall there and i did have the crew go through and remove a bunch of trees there this winter um, almost all the trees they removed from there were alanthus so tree of heaven which is a non-native species and a lot of them were in really bad condition um, and so um, they were they're a very brittle tree as well and we were just having a lot of call-ins where branches were falling or chunks of the tree were falling in the road there and with the curve it just wasn't a safe situation so I'd wanted them to do it for a couple years, and this winter I finally got them in there to do that. So that's that's primarily what we removed from that wall. Um, and then, yeah, I think the cemetery definitely went through a period where it wasn't really that tightly maintained, and I think a lot of weedy trees got in there. There's a lot of mulberry and nori maple and things like that that just kind of seeded themselves in, and they might have been next to a stone and didn't get mowed around, and then they grew, and now they're tipping the stone over. So we do have a lot of that, and I've been trying to do a little bit better maintenance there at the cemetery and we do have a group now the friends of the city cemetery that's putting a lot of effort into um, you know writing up some of the stones um, and raising some money additional money for the cemetery um, the difficult thing about the city cemetery is the way that New York State law is um, if you're a private cemetery there's different funding opportunities so if it's a church held cemetery or something like that or a private family cemetery that's historic there's different funding opportunities and grants you can get but if it's a municipal cemetery, you're not allowed to access those funds. You're not allowed to apply for those funds. I think the thought process is, well, it's a municipality, so you can just keep digging into the taxpayer's pockets and increase taxes if you need to fix the cemetery. You're not gonna go bankrupt, you know? Um, but it doesn't work that way. Like, you know, I, I have gotten some money for the cemetery. We had um, a $75,000 capital grant from the city, the city's funding to uh, repair some of the vaults that are on that hillside. And then Cornell donated $75,000 to match what the city was putting in. So we we're able to fix a bunch of those vaults. But I think the cemetery is a really missed opportunity. I think we really need to treat it more like a park 
because it is 17 acres of green space right in downtown. And so we, that's why we've created the tree tour there to try to get more people in there to walk through it and really use it as a park and use it as a green space and use it as a trail. And possibly if we can designate it as not just a cemetery, but a city park that might open us up to some other funding opportunities, some park funding opportunities. Um, but it's really challenging. It's hard to do tree work there. It's hard to get equipment in there. A lot of that work I have to contract out, which becomes expensive. So it's something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it. Um, I think it's a really missed space. And I just found out we're going to have a bird, the, bir the Cornell Bird Club, or the Cayuga Bird Club is going to do a birding session there in the spring to bring people out and to wander through there and see what kind of warblers and whatnot we can find there. Well, if there right. are no more questions, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on such a beautiful day. You could have been outside, but you came here to learn about This trees. has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.